Welcome back, my friends. I'm happy you're here for part two of my step-by-step -step tutorial on how to forge my painting, Lucrezia Claro. This is the second video out of six as part of this lesson on how to forge my painting, which is part of my weird curriculum at the unaccredited College of Clare. You'll be able to find the previous video on how to forge Lucrezia Claro, along with the subsequent video lessons at patreon.com slash Claire Lockhart. Please double check the spelling since my name is spelled with a K, so patreon.com slash Claire Lockhart. For part two, you're going to paint the background and the face. On the left, is where we left off with part one. So the canvas has the pencil drawing of the portrait of Lucrezia Claro. And after all the work you do in part two, you'll have about half of your canvas covered with paint. I'm going to share that part two is a little difficult. Okay, I lied. It's actually very challenging. It's especially if you have not worked with oil paints before or it's been a long time since you've mixed color. But I am going to guide you through this process step by step with a combination of photographs and videos. So that way you'll be able to see all the steps I took. I'm doing this because of course I want you to have a successful painting at the end and also I think it's going to be hilarious when a few hundred years down the road you have curators and art historians finding all of these forgeries of my painting where you're using the same techniques as me. They're going to be baffled and wonder how on earth you were able to do such an incredible forgery. And unless these videos survive, they're going to have no idea. I want you to notice that with my example on the right, you'll see that my brush strokes are scratchy and my paint isn't blended. I don't think my paintings look very good after the first or second or even third layer of paint. And as you're painting, if you get frustrated and you think your painting doesn't look very good, this is the image I want you to refer back to. The paint will be blobby and scratchy. We're not trying to get the whole face done in one sitting. I use many layers of paint in order to create shadows and form and texture. And I hope that you'll trust me to guide you through this process. I know painting is hard. It is difficult but I am going to show you everything I do to assure your success. And I know you can handle this challenge. The very first thing you're going to do is mix black paint. I know you can purchase pre-mixed paint and I've tried it in the past, but truly I find it better to have my own paint that I mixed. I'm going to actually mix a warm black and a cool black. And if you're starting your career as an art forger, well, you have to use the same techniques as me, right? <laughs> so to mix your black paint, you'll need the following supplies. First of all, you'll need your palette and a palette knife. You'll notice I have two different palette knives. The one on the right with the big flat edge is wonderful for mixing paint. If you have different palette knives already, you can just use those. But I highly recommend to my friends and colleagues and students to get one with a big flat edge because it really helps you thoroughly mix up your paint. I also have a long skinny palette knife because I'm going to show you how to mix up a lot of paint to save for later if you want. But I'll talk more about that later. You need your burnt umber and ultramarine blue paint. Additionally, you'll need your rags. You should wear gloves while you're mixing up paint and have a glass scraper on hand. That's one of those little razor blade scrapers. It's really good at thoroughly cleaning your palette between color mixings. Now, 
if you want to save time in the future, you can mix up a lot of black paint and save it for later. You'll see that I have two empty tubes for paint and I've labeled them one for warm black and one for cool black. And in the top right hand corner of my palette, I have a tube ringer. That's what I use to get all the paint out of the tubes. You can see I have been using the Burnt Umber in Ultramarine Blue for a while and I use that tube ringer to squeeze out all the paint. I also use it to crimp the bottom of the empty tubes when I fill them with my mixed paint. Now you do not have to mix up a lot of paint to store it for future use right now. When I started painting, I would mix up my black every time I set up my palette for about the first year or so before I felt comfortable enough making so much that I wanted to use it for many subsequent paintings. Now, if I would have had someone show me exactly how to mix up a lot of paint and put it in tubes, I probably would have been more ambitious and tried to do it sooner, but you are under no obligation to try that out today. I really do recommend just for the first few times that you're painting and mixing up your black, do a small amount so that way you can get a feel for the color, see what it looks like when it dries, and see if you really enjoy it before you're committed to using up half of your brown and blue in order to make all this black paint. But if you do anticipate creating a lot of paintings down the line, I recommend doing this because future you will thank you. You can mix up your black paint every time you set up your palette if you want. And I do recommend mixing up only what you need right now so you can get the hang of mixing black before you commit to using up so much of your burnt umber and ultramarine blue. To save time, however, I mix up a lot of black and tube it, and it will last me dozens of paintings. I'm mixing a lot of paint that will last me a long, long time. But if you are new to mixing paint or you haven't mixed black before, I do recommend only mixing a small amount so you can get practice with it and you'll just use up what you mix every day. Even though I am probably mixing more paint than you will use right now, you will follow the same process, but you'll probably only squeeze out a small amount of paint, like the amount of toothpaste you'd use if you're brushing your teeth. To create black paint, you mix burnt umber and ultramarine blue together. Start with the brown and add the blue to it gradually. I am making warm black, which has more brown than blue in the mix. Warm black is great for making a black that appears to come forward. If you are going to prepare a lot of black like I am, Use a skinny palette knife to put it in the back of the paint tube. Avoid closing the tube with air bubbles in it. Use a tube ringer to seal the tube shut. It's also a great idea to label your tube with your recipes so you know exactly what you're using every time. To create cool black, start with burnt umber and gradually add ultramarine blue. Cool black appears more blue than brown, and it is useful for making black that recedes. I prefer to use the wide palette knife when I mix paint because it permits me to combine the colors thoroughly. You need to look carefully at your paint to make sure there aren't any streaks of color. It should be uniform. Only mix a little amount unless you plan to put the excess in tubes. If you want to make a lot of paint to save for later, this will take you a bit more time. It took me about 15 minutes to mix up each giant amount of black, but this will save me time in the long run. If you're only mixing up what you need for today, it will go a lot faster, and the more practice you have, the quicker you'll get. It is also critical that you do a fantastic job of cleaning your palette when you're done so you don't contaminate other paint you'll put on it later.
Allow me to break down those steps on how to mix black paint a little bit more. You're going to mix burnt umber and ultramarine blue together to create your blacks. And I know some people prefer to buy pre-made manufactured black, but for me, I have a much higher degree of success when I create my own. That's because I am able to mix warm and cool black. This is really important when you're dealing with local color. And what I mean by that is if an object is overall one color, it doesn't look completely smooth or uniform due to the way light and shadows hit it. So for example, on my palette in the top left corner, you can see a little black rag, and that's just fabric that's folded up. You'll notice that where the light is hitting it, those highlights are lighter. They're not quite gray, they're actually warmer, and warmer colors tend to come forward. They tend to look like they're moving toward the viewer. You'll also notice that in the shadows, the black is even darker, it's cooler. Cool colors tend to recede or move away from the viewer. And we will be using that concept of warm and cool, of push and pull throughout this painting. And that's why it's important to have a warm and a cool black. I am using Williamsburg oil paints, and these are a very high quality paint that lend you the ability to mix colors very successfully. They are pretty expensive though. If you need a cheaper alternative, Utrecht brand is pretty good. They still give you the opportunity to mix colors the way you intend. If you're using a different brand of paint, be wary of really cheap or student grade paints that have the word hue, H-U-E, in the title. Those are paints that look correct when you squeeze them out of the tube, but they're not quite the right pigments. They're cheaper alternatives, and so when you mix them together, you may get some unwanted surprises. And I just want to save you time and money in the long run. So I would avoid buying paints with the word hue in them unless you're doing a specific project where you're not mixing any colors together. Now, when I make warm black, I use more burnt umber in the mix and I gradually add the blue to it until it looks pretty black, but it's just a little bit warm. And then with the cool black, I still tend to try and start with the, with the warm color first and then keep adding blue because the blue can get overpowering really fast and you don't want your black to look overwhelmingly blue. You want it to be like a really dark black hole void type of black. And when you are new to color mixing oil painting, or if you haven't tried mixing your own black paint before, I really do recommend you only mix what you need for today. So squeezing a small amount of brown and blue out at first, like the amount you would squeeze out for toothpaste if you're brushing your teeth to start with is really good, and you can always squeeze out more, but you can't put the excess paint back in your tube and I don't want you to be wasteful when you're starting. After you've mixed up your black paints, you're going to create some gray paint for the background. And when you're mixing gray, you want to start with the white and gradually add the black to it. When you are mixing colors together, it's important for you to remember to always start with the lighter color. If you started with black and added white to it and tried to lighten it up, you could easily go through your entire tube of white paint in one day. And I'm giving you this advice to start with the lighter color first because it will save you time, paint, and ultimately a lot of money. So squeeze out like a quarter size blob of white paint on your palette and then move maybe half of it to over to a new spot using your palette knife. Dip just the tip of your palette knife in one of the blacks and then stir those colors together. You can see on my example on the top left corner of the photo, I have a light gray 
and it's warmer because I mix the warm black into it. And I want you to mix up a very light gray, a medium gray, and a dark gray. In my example, immediately to the right of my warm gray is a cooler, more medium type gray. So I started with white and then I added cool black to it until it got to be about this color. When you're making gray, please feel free to experiment by adding the warm black or the cool black. You can even add both of them together to get a more neutral gray where it doesn't look too warm or too cool. And you will be using many layers of paint to create that background so it gives you a lot of opportunities to experiment and mix colors. But I really do recommend just starting with a light, a medium, and a dark gray to get you started. After you've mixed up your gray paint, you're going to be ready to paint the background. This is pretty exciting because you're going to take your canvas, which only has a drawing on it, to having the first layer of paint done in the background. The reason I start with the background first is because paint is a physical medium and it has a physical presence. Even if you're painting very thin, it shows up. And if you do the background first and then paint your subject, your model in front of the background, it makes the background recede and it gives your painting an extra layer of depth and realism. I also want you to notice in my example that my first layer of paint isn't smooth. I am just getting the basic colors. I have simplified everything and I have like a light and a medium and a dark gray. You'll also notice that my brush strokes change direction and that's because I'm following the folds of the fabric and that helps make the texture appear correctly. When you're ready to start, gather the following materials to paint your background. You need your palette and palette knife. You'll need your burnt umber, ultramarine blue, and titanium white paint. Get your rags, golden tacklon brushes. You need your reference photo. I really recommend that you print it out for this because I don't want you to get paint on your computer or phone or tablet or anything. Also, it will remain consistent throughout the process of you working. When I paint and I'm adding color, I will print my photo reference. Of course, you'll also need your canvas. Furthermore, you'll need your Gelkid Light and Gamasol. You need your odorless mineral spirits to clean out your brushes as you work. You'll want a small container to mix your Gelkid Light and Gamasol together. Have your master's brush cleaner ready for when you're done working. And I also suggest having plastic wrap on hand. You can cover your paints that you don't use with plastic wrap and save it for a later session. I usually mix a light gray by starting with white and adding a little bit of black to it. I make my medium gray by starting with white and adding a little bit more black to it. Even for my dark gray, I begin with white because it's easier to make a color darker and this prevents me from wasting paint. I also had warm and cool black on my palette for the background. This first layer is going to be a simplified version of what you see in your reference image. All the paint you add in this first layer will eventually be covered, so it's okay if it isn't perfect. Use a pretty big paintbrush for this step to save some time. Now, if you really don't like how the paint looks, you can wipe it off the canvas with your rag. I often like to block in all the lightest areas first, and I tend to mix my paint a little lighter than how it should look in the end. That's because it's easier to add shadows later than to try to lighten up the painting. When I paint, I dip my clean paintbrush in the Gelkid Gamasol mixture, and then I dip the tip of my bristles into the paint. I only mix enough medium into my paint that I will use it in that immediate brush stroke. I've seen many people make the mistake of mixing a big dollop of medium in with all the paint they have on their palette with their palette knife and it messes up the paint, so don't do that. 
the medium makes the paint dry faster, and it also makes the paint see-through. The more medium you use, the more translucent your paint will become. You want the first layer to be opaque because your goal is to cover up the pencil marks. I often hold a rag in my non-dominant hand so I can clean off my brush quickly. Notice that I change the direction of my brush strokes to go with the folds in the background fabric. But don't blend any of your paint together in this layer. Your goal is just to get the basic colors down in the right spots. If you ignore the time it took me to set up and mix my paints, I spent almost 20 minutes just adding paint to my canvas for the background for this step. Just to emphasize some of the main points about painting your background, I want to remind you first of all to dip your brush in the medium first and then into your paint before you add it to your canvas. You're only going to mix what you will use immediately. So take your clean paintbrush, just dip the tip in the medium, and then put it in a teeny tiny amount of paint and swish swish it together and then pop that paint right up on your canvas. You only want to use as little medium as possible because you don't want the paint to get too translucent. You don't want it to become see-through. The reason you paint the background first is so that your subject will overlap the paint in the background. Paint is a physical medium and that thickness of paint will be apparent to the viewer even if it's a very minute change. Also, you're going to use gray and black to create that backdrop. You'll see that I have light grays and medium gray and dark gray on my canvas. You can also see my brush strokes very clearly. That's fine. Don't waste any time blending your paint in this step. Completing that first layer of paint for your background is quite an accomplishment. I know it can be intimidating to add paint to your canvas for the first time, but you did it. But you don't get to take a break. You have to move on to something a little bit more tricky. I'm going to show you how to mix the skin tones for the portrait. Painting portraits can be very difficult, even with a lot of experience. I'm going to say it is a challenge each and every time, but if you have a plan, if you have someone to help you, like me, it will make it more manageable. And I'm going to show you how to mix up skin colors that you will apply to this particular portrait, but you can use the same information and apply it to pictures that you create completely on your own that, you know, aren't forgeries. That won't confuse future art historians. To mix up your skin colors, you need these materials. You need your palette and palette knife, have some rags on hand, you'll want to wear your gloves, have your glass scraper so you can clean your palette really well between the colors. If you want to make a lot of paint and use it throughout this portrait, you'll need a tube ringer and five empty tubes of paint. However, if you are new to oil painting or haven't mixed up a lot of skin tones before, it's not a bad idea and it's definitely not a waste of your time to mix up these five colors every time you sit down to paint. I didn't start mixing up big amounts of skin color paint to use for later until I had been painting with oils for a couple years and I had made a lot of paintings. And the reason I waited was I just wanted to make sure that I had the colors that would work best for me. Now, if you want to expedite this process, you are more than welcome to use the recipes I've developed for myself. So whether you want to just mix up a little bit each time, that is perfectly fine. That's what I did when I started painting. Or if you want to take a plunge and make up a bunch of paint for future use, you are more than welcome to try that as well. The colors you need 
to make skin tones include titanium white, zinc white, cadmium red, cadmium yellow, yellow ochre, burnt umber, and burnt sienna. The first color I'm going to make is a light skin color. You can see these are the tubes of paint that I've made for myself, and I'm going to show you how to mix up enough paint to fill a tube, but don't feel obligated to make that much paint. Part of the reason I'm doing this demonstration on such a big scale is so you have this information in case you decide you want to create your own colors and put them in tubes later, but also when I mix up a lot of paint, you can really see what I'm doing as opposed to me mixing up a teeny tiny amount that I would use just for one session of painting. But to create the lightest skin color I need for this painting, I start with titanium white, I use zinc white, I also combine cadmium red, yellow ochre, and cadmium yellow into this mixture. You can mix up skin colors every time you paint, or you can cheat like I do and mix up a lot of paint and put it in tubes for later. The first year I painted with oils, I mixed my skin colors every single time, but once I got the hang of mixing skin tones, I bought some small, empty tubes and mixed up a huge amount of paint. Since I paint in many thin layers, a set of five small tubes of skin color will last for dozens of paintings and it usually takes me a couple years to use them all the way. The recipe I use for skin color includes titanium white, which is a warm, opaque white, zinc white is cool and translucent, cadmium red, which is a warm red, and one of the biggest reasons I wear gloves, cadmium yellow, and that's a cool yellow, yellow ochre, which is a warm yellow, burnt umber, and a little bit of burnt sienna. Regardless of who I am painting, this recipe works pretty well, whether I am depicting someone with very pale skin like me, or I am painting a person with a dark complexion. The ratios will vary. I like to prepare my palette by squeezing out my paint near the top edge, starting with white, going to red, following the flow of the color wheel and ending with brown at the opposite corner. If you're just mixing paint for today, use a lot less paint than I am using. Squeeze out about a jelly bean size of paint for all the colors, but have more titanium white on your palette. Every time you scoop paint from the top edge, do your best to clean your palette knife with a cloth. I like to start by mixing yellow ochre, cadmium red, and cadmium yellow to create an orange for my base. When you paint, it's always a good idea to start with the lightest color first and then add the darker colors. I will combine titanium white with a little bit of zinc white and then I will blend the orange paint into it. I will gradually add the orange mix to my white paint and thoroughly blend it together until there aren't any streaks. I will adjust the color as necessary. For example, if it is too yellow, then I will add a tiny amount of extra red. If the color is too dark, then I will start with a new batch of white and then add the color I just mixed up into the white. Once I have enough, I will fill the paint tube and then seal it with the ringer. You can see that I've labeled my tubes with light skin, medium skin 1, medium skin 2, medium skin 3, and dark skin. It just helps me stay organized. I'm going to demonstrate next how I created what I call medium skin 1. This is a combination of titanium white, zinc white, cadmium red, yellow ochre, and cadmium yellow. It's the same combination you just used, but it has more color pigment in it, so it appears a little darker. It's important to clean your palette with a glass scraper between mixing colors. You need to work on an extremely clean surface, otherwise you'll contaminate your paint unintentionally. 
after I mix up my lightest skin color, I move on to one of the medium tones. For my five colors, I have a very light beige color, three medium tones, and one dark color without any white at all. To make the first medium skin color, I will begin with a combination of titanium white and zinc white. Then I will blend yellow ochre, cadmium red, and cadmium yellow into it. If my mix is too red, then I will adjust it by adding more yellows to it. If my color gets too dark, then I will move it to the side, start over with the whites, and then add my too dark mix to the white. Don't add white to the too dark color because you will often wind up with too much paint and use up way more white than you intended. Since I am preparing a lot of paint, I will seal my batch of paint in a tube for later. The third color I'll mix is what I call medium skin too. This is titanium white with zinc white. I also used cadmium red, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, and then just a little bit of burnt umber. For my next skin tone, I will use a combination of titanium white, zinc white, yellow ochre, cadmium red, and cadmium yellow. I will also need burnt umber for this recipe. First, I combine titanium white with zinc white. Then, I will blend yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, and cadmium red to create an orange. After I have this mixed, I will add a little burnt umber to make the color darker and more neutral. As always, I start with the lightest colors first which means I start with the white and add the colors to it. This helps me control what I'm making without getting the color too dark too fast. Because I am making a lot of paint, once I get a color I like, I will replicate that color to get a big batch to last me for years. Since I paint portraits so often, it makes sense for me to prepare a lot of paint and keep it in tubes so future Claire can save a little time setting up. I'm going to mix up my third medium skin tone. This will be the darkest out of the three, and this one also includes the most amount of colors in the mix. I start with titanium white and zinc white. From there, I add cadmium red, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, and burnt umber. This mixture is a little different because this time I include burnt sienna as well. I am mixing up my third medium skin color, which will be the darkest color so far. To create this next skin color, I start with yellow ochre, and then I add cadmium yellow, cadmium red, and then burnt umber. I also add burnt sienna to the mix. Once again, I am using Williamsburg handmade oils, and if you have the same paint as me, you'll have an easier time creating these mixtures. If you're using a different brand, make sure you're not using paint with the word hue on the label because it might not mix correctly. After I get a good dark skin tone mixed up, I will move that paint aside, then plop down the whites. I will gradually add more of the colors until I get a good medium skin color mixed together. I can adjust my color as necessary. If it is too yellow, then I will add more red, for example. If I am making paint just for one session, I wouldn't even use a fraction of this amount of paint. I probably would only mix up about a teaspoon of this color total for one painting session. However, because I am filling a tube and plan to use this paint for dozens of portraits, I am making a huge amount. 
if you are new to oil painting, I would recommend only mixing what you need each day until you get familiar with the process and feel confident enough to mix up a big batch of paint. The last color I make in my array of skin colors is probably my most important. This is what I have labeled as dark skin. And I did that because there is no white at all in this mixture. It is just color. So to create this, you're going to combine cadmium red, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, burnt umber, and burnt sienna. The dark skin mix is very important to have on your palette. To mix up this darkest skin color, I start with yellow ochre, add cadmium yellow, and then add cadmium red. I also include a lot of burnt umber and burnt sienna to this recipe. For the darkest skin color, I don't include any whites in this mixture. Once again, I'd like to share that it's okay to mix up only small amounts of paint for this project. It's usually a good idea to have a lot of color mixing experience before or mixing up this much paint. I am demonstrating how to mix up a stockpile of paint in case you want to try it later, but also you really get to see my colors because I have a ton of paint on my palette. You might notice that I had to change my skinny palette knife, but that's because I accidentally broke the one I really like, but I live in a rural area and would have to order a new one and have it shipped to me so I used what I had available. Once I have all my paint mixed up, it's important for me to clean up my palette with a paint scraper and then wipe off the surface with a clean rag. I'd also like to note that it took me about an hour and a half to mix up all this paint. However, if I was only making a small amount, it would only take me a few minutes to mix up each color. After you've mixed up all that paint, your reward is that you get to start painting the face. Now, I know that painting a portrait can be a challenge. Art is hard. There's a reason not everybody does it. But I am going to guide you through all these steps that I take. Typically, people only see my finished paintings and they don't get to see all the work and layers that go into this process. I am showing you all of these steps not only because I want to help you confuse a future x-ray tech who is examining your painting and trying to figure out how on earth you were able to forge my art so successfully, but I also want to show you the process I personally use that way if you want to make your own original portraits in the future, you'll be able to apply these steps to your own artwork. Now, I think the first few layers of my paintings are not so successful. Like this is not anything I would display publicly. My first layers are very scratchy. I really don't think my paintings start to come together until I am about 90% done but I think it's important for me to show you what this looks like so you have a realistic idea of what to aim for. So at this point, your painting just has one layer of paint in the background. And after this painting session, you're going to have one layer of the face done. And that's pretty tricky, but we want to get started on the face right away. That's because you'll need to do a lot of layers on it in order to sculpt those features and shadows. And we also need to do the face before you do the hair and the clothes because as I've said before, paint is a physical medium and the hair overlaps the skin on the face and the head. And so you have to do the face first before you could do the hair. It just makes your painting look and feel like it has depth and it makes it more realistic. To paint the face, you're going to need a lot of materials. First of all, you need all your paint. And I want to show you how I set up my palette when I paint. 
I start off with white in the top left corner and then I move through the color wheel to the neutral colors, the browns on the top right corner. So I start off with titanium white and I put a bit of that down because I use a lot of it. I don't use very much zinc white so I put a very small dab underneath the titanium white and I always set up my palette in a similar way so I know exactly what colors I've placed where. Then I use a tiny bit of cadmium red. It's like a tic-tac size. I don't need a lot of cadmium red and also it's really expensive. Then there is alizarin crimson. After that I have a blob of yellow ochre and cadmium yellow, a tiny dash of viridian green, a small amount of cobalt blue, then there is ultramarine blue and burnt umber because I need a bit more of that, especially when I'm making my skin tones darker and shadows. And then on uh, the right corner, I have a little bit of burnt sienna. You also need to have the following colors mixed up. You need a light skin color. You also need your medium skin colors and then that dark skin color. That is the combination of the yellows plus cadmium red and the browns, but there's no white in it whatsoever. And you can see I added a second row to my paint and then at the far right I have warm black and then I have cool black. And I put them in that order so I can quickly know which black is which. I like having the warm first because it's for the lighter areas and then cool black all the way to the right because that is for the darkest spots on my painting. Of course you'll need your palette and palette knife. You need some rags on hand plus your glass scraper for cleaning up when you're done. You want to have your odorless mineral spirits nearby so you can clean out your brushes when you switch colors. You can see on my palette I have my little container with Galkid Light and just a drop or two of Gamasol. For my brushes, I want to have a big one and a smaller one. I try to use as big of brushes as I can to help save me time. Also, on this layer, you're not going to blend any of your paint. And the bigger brush helps me remember not to blend anything. I'm just putting basic colors down in the right spots. It's a much simplified version of what the painting will finally look like in the end. Of course, you need that reference photo and canvas. I highly recommend that you have it printed out. If you haven't done that yet, please do that. It's important to have one stable copy, not only because you don't want to spill on any of your technology with the paint or any of the chemicals we're using, but also when you have a printed image, it won't change. The way the light is coming from the screen won't affect what you're seeing. So that's why I keep saying have a printed copy of that photo. You'll also need your brush cleaner for when you're all done today. And I highly recommend having plastic wrap because you could put it over the top of your palette to keep your paints from drying out too fast. So this is great if you need to take a break and grab a snack or if you're unable to finish in one session, you can come back to it the next day. When I paint the face, I start with the eyes because they are overlapped by the eyelids. I typically paint the whites of the eyes first with a combination of titanium white, my lightest skin color mix, and a little bit of ultramarine blue to create shadows. For the irises, I began with viridian green, and I mixed in a little bit of yellow ochre, but I didn't blend anything. For the pupils, I used cool black composed of burnt umber and ultramarine blue. I left the highlights in the eyes blank for now because I didn't want to smear the irises. To create the tear ducts and eyelids, I start with the light and medium skin tones. This is a combination of titanium white, zinc white, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, and cadmium red. I also use just a little bit of alizarin crimson, which is the cool red, in the tear ducts. 
I always print my reference image, and I often hang it to my left side since I'm right-handed, and I prefer to have my palette on my dominant side to make everything as ergonomic as possible. If you're left-handed, though, keep your palette on your left side. That way you don't have to twist around a lot while you're working. I usually like to paint in the contrasting colors first because I can see them the best. To make my shadows darker, I need to desaturate them. I do this by adding a little bit of ultramarine blue to my skin tone color since blue is the opposite of orange, and you can make a color darker and duller by mixing in the complementary color. The darkest shadows in the entire portrait are in the nostrils, and I will combine ultramarine blue into my darkest skin tone mix, which is my skin color without any white. If I mixed it into the skin color that has a little bit of white in it, it might gray out, but this is a very, very dark area, so it's okay just to exclude the white for that section. Once I get a few of my shadows in place, I like to paint the lightest areas of skin next. I often have to mix titanium white with a little of the lightest skin color to create the lightest areas if I am painting someone with very pale skin. I usually paint skin much lighter than it needs to be at first since I know I am going to add many more layers later on and it's easier to add shadows over the top of light colors. For this first layer, I am just blocking in the colors in a rough way. To be honest, I am self-conscious about how my paintings look in the beginning because they appear sloppy and overly simplified. But it's important for me to share this process so you feel confident you're on the right track in the work you're doing. If you paint using the technique that I use, you probably will think your canvas looks weird at this stage too, but that's how it is supposed to look. When I paint, I make sure that my brush strokes follow the topography of the face. The brush strokes on the forehead will be pretty horizontal. The cheeks will slope down towards the nose. Now it's really important to paint the cross contours on the neck and I mean that you'll need to paint side to side. If you paint a neck vertically, it will look like you're trying to paint a beard, but you don't really know what a beard looks like. As I said earlier, I like to paint the contrasts first, so I tend to do the dark shadows, then the lightest spots, and finally fill in those middle tones. For this first layer, don't worry about blending anything. Your goal is just to have paint over the entire face and neck. This layer will be completely covered up at the end. When I paint the mouth, I combine a little alizarin crimson with the skin colors. For this layer, don't worry about blending anything. I also want to point out that I didn't paint in eyebrows. I just marked where they will go with a slightly darker skin color, and I also didn't bother with eyelashes yet. Remember, you're just painting a simplified version of the portrait to mark where the colors and shadows go. I'm going to summarize all of those steps to help you remember what to do when you start painting the face. So remember, the goal is to simplify the face and neck with general blocks of color. You're not matching the final portrait. Right now, you are painting the light areas, the dark areas, and then just filling in everything else with those medium skin colors. Don't bother blending during this step. Use the biggest paintbrush you have that's within reason, to paint the skin. That will prevent you from trying to put in too many tiny details. Also remember to use ultramarine blue to desaturate skin colors. Your skin has an orange base because of those yellows and reds, and blue is the complementary color of orange. And when you mix those two colors, they neutralize each other. They cancel them out. 
And so if you have a mixture that's mostly orange with a little bit of blue, it makes that orange darker and duller. And you can see those really dark shadows on the portrait, particularly the one on our right, but the model's left side of her face. That dark, dull shadow is the blue mixed in with the skin color. I also would like to remind you to mix alizarin crimson into the skin colors to create the lips. And so as you're painting, remember, don't blend anything. You're just putting in big blocks of colors and your goal is to cover up those pencil marks. After you're done painting, please remember to take the time to clean up. So for cleaning up, you want your brush cleaner, access to running water, and I highly recommend having some plastic wrap. When you wash your brushes, clean them out as best you can in your odorless mineral spirits and dry them off on a rag. And then wash out your brush using that brush cleaner. You'll just lather, rinse, repeat until your brush is as clean as you can get it. Now before you let the brush dry, you should reshape the bristles so it resembles a new brush or as close to it as possible. So just pinch those bristles and make everything nice and smooth. You want your brushes to stay in good condition, especially for the last few layers of your painting because those will be the top layers and you want your brushes to be in good condition for that step. I also recommend that you cover up any unused paint with plastic wrap. You're able to save oil paint for quite a while. Any of the paint that you didn't mix and didn't touch the medium to should last for a few days underneath the plastic wrap. Paints that you mixed up or may have some of that medium in will dry out a lot faster, but if you only wait like a day or two between painting today and when you move on to the next step, a lot of those paints will still be usable. Now, if it's just a small amount of paint or it get crusty because of the medium, just use that glass scraper to clean off your palette. I know that part two was a big challenge. This is probably the most difficult part of the entire forgery process, and I need to tell you how proud I am of you. Keep up the good work. In part two, you had to mix and match paints. You put the first layer of paint on the background and then you started the face. Painting a portrait is a challenge and you are up for it. I want to let you know that each time you paint, it is going to get a little easier. You'll get faster at mixing those colors and you'll really be happy with the subsequent layers of paint you put on your canvas. This project is going to be amazing. Now you should take a little time to rest because you deserve a break, but also you need to let your canvas dry about a day or two before you move on to part three. You'll be able to find part three of Steal My Art on patreon.com slash Claire Lockhart. This is part of my curriculum at the unaccredited College of Claire. So once you're ready, head on over to patreon.com slash Claire Lockhart, and you'll be able to continue to work on your incredible forgery.